I am Dave Dressler. I am your MC this morning. I am the National Space Society's Conferences Committee Chair. I organize the International Space Development Conference with an uh, uh, excellent group of people. But today we, we have Mars as our focus. And our, our second speaker this morning is Dr. Gregory Benford. And uh, Dr. Benford is a professor right here at UCI. I wonder if he had something to do with our, our venue this, this time around. <laughs> uh, Dr. Benford is uh, uh, Professor Emeritus, UCI. Areas of research uh, studies extremely strong turbulence, particular, particularly in astrophysical contexts, and magnetic structures from the galactic center to large scale galactic jets. Sounds like pulsars or something of that nature. Uh, as a leading science fiction author, Dr. Benford is perhaps best known for the Galactic Center saga novels, which postulates a galaxy in which sentient organic life is in constant warfare with sentient electromechanical life. You know, something that could potentially happen on this planet. Let's hope not, but uh, without any more, Dr. Benford, please take the stage. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're all here today because I always wanted to have a Mars Society meeting that I could walk to from my home, <laughs> uh, a, a grand distance of about two-thirds of a kilometer. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, the kind of prospect I think we need to envision in the next century, uh, and this is a key to it. This is a five-year-old book, which uh, we, with the help of some very nice funding from NASA, 40,000 bucks plus uh, $80,000 from UCSD to hold a two-day meeting, launched in order to start uh, thinking about the infrastructure to be built in the solar system over the next century so that we could go to the stars, perhaps. That actually was the inspiration for Yuri Milner to start the Breakthrough Initiative for the development of a, of a small sail beam-driven interstellar craft on a scale of a few decades. He wanted to hurry it up because he's not getting any younger. But he does have several billion dollars, which helps. So uh, in doing this, you've got to, uh, this is the back of the cover, and that's the list of all the people who are in it. Because I'm a science fiction writer and a scientist, it's got nonfiction and fiction together, all directed to the theme of how do we solve this problem? And it includes a great deal about, of course, developing the, the solar system industrially. And here's your little history lesson. This is the United States in 1812. And Thomas Jefferson really did say that in a letter to Congress. <laughs> he thought it would take 1,000 years. That's right. He was off by one and a half orders of magnitude <laughs> to develop the United States and to reach the ocean, by which he meant this Pacific, which is the most misnamed ocean, I think, in the world. Uh, uh, I come from down there, by the way. Uh, actually, I was uh, born in what was then West Florida and belonged to Spain. I'm from Fairhope, Alabama, in Mobile Bay. Um, where I live, people try to change this map in a different way, but we'll, that's another subject. Uh, <coughs> what Jefferson did not see was that this train, this is the first commercial train, 1804, was already in the world and would change everything he thought about North America, and he just didn't make that next step. Uh, he thought it would take a thousand years. Here's when we, we completed the railroad to California so that people who wanted to go somewhere could go here, and uh, that's why I'm here too. Uh, um, so the point is, <laughs> he was off an enormous factor. And this is uh, what he thought would be the prospect. And of course, I've, I've laid all this out because it's useful to find out how we got all this stuff. Most, most of it, we bought it from the French and we simply took it away from the Mexicans. You know, in two wars, uh, the first one about Texas independence, I went to high school in Dallas because my father commanded the US National Guard from there. And uh, the Texans alone, anybody here from Texas, took their place away from the Mexicans. And then the same general, when Texas entered the Union, because it was running out of money, although it didn't have a space program, uh, the same general, Santa Ana, for whom we named the Red Wind here in California, uh, 
uh, across the border into Texas, which was then a state of the Union, precipitated a war in which they lost everything else, for example, where we're sitting. Now, there are going to be problems with opening up any frontier, and this, appropriately, is in Paris. <laughs> it's not an American accident. accident. Um, but the point is that the solar system can be developed with technologies, as Bob has just made the case, for a true new frontier. That's our atmosphere, trying to draw your attention there. That's, that's the essentially the whole height of the atmosphere, roughly 100 kilometers. Um, notice that you only get that perspective by getting outside the atmosphere, which is an overall lesson that we all understand emotionally. I'm going to make the case, just slightly, that the major things to develop the solar system economically are nuclear rockets, space robots, and 3D printers. Notice that we already have all these. We have nuclear rockets sitting in a warehouse in Nevada that was developed by the United States, and there was a similar program in the Soviet Union at Semi Palatinsk, which got um, ISPs, the specific impulses, almost four times larger than the Saturn V. That has improved the launch efficiency by, by a factor of actually a little over three and a half. Um, robots, because if you're going to mine, and uh, I know a, a lot of the space miners, uh, and Elon Musk, who I think of as a space major, uh, <laughs> they all agree that this is probably the most profitable thing. By the way, that was also true of the American West. Farming got a lot of press because people need to eat, but in fact, this rapid spread of railroads, so that where I came from just two days ago, Mammoth, California, which is a mining area, had a railroad only 15 years after the first railroad went to California. I mean, that's how quickly railroads spread because they were by far the most economic way to move things around in the American West. And the lesson took, this is the opening of Disneyland. Its central metaphor in Tomorrowland was this rocket. <laughs> It was not a robot. Actually, they used Robbie the robot, <laughs> but <laughs> Robbie the robot had a human in it. Just, just. I hope that doesn't doesn't shock you, but <laughs> um, mostly because they needed it to talk, but it didn't move much. Um, Disneyland, by the way. Oh, this way. What's? How come it's not going forward? <laughs> Somehow it's not going forward. Yeah, that must be it, yeah. Um, by the way, d if you're interested, Disneyland is only 20 miles from here, and if you walk to the top of uh, University Hills, where I live, you can actually see the 9 p.m. rocketry display. <laughs> uh, it's only uh, two-thirds of a kilometer away. Can you move that forward? Now it will. Okay, good. I like this topographic view of the inner solar system <laughs> in which you can see the, the, the gravitational, well, here they're seen in a, well, you, you, you can make your eyes make it either way. You, it's either a pit, a gravitational pit, or it's a hill to climb. doesn't matter what the metaphor here is. But here they are, distributed at a certain moment. Uh, Mercury, Venus, here's the good old Earth down here. And there's Mars up there with its little moons around it. I always like to think of it as a territory because this looks like the kind of style of maps of the Old West in the 19th century. Um, hmm. It's again not moving. <laughs> yeah? There. And here's another topo view. These are the Lagrange points. I'm not going to go into the economics of that. There's, there's only a small economic advantage, and there's some stability in the orbit, not a great deal in the Lagrange, but I always like to see them because uh, when I was on sabbatical leave in Torino, I lived on Lagrange Avenue, uh, <laughs> the only major capital in Europe in which uh, there, the main street has a statue of a mathematical physicist on it <laughs> and is named for him. Um, but I want to point out the American tradition. This is the first novel, first extended story, really, about having a space station written by an American, interestingly the same <laughs> year that the railroad opened. And, uh, of course, it's made out of brick because that seemed a, a good, cheap way to do it. Uh, and um, and it's actually quite good. And now I, we all remember this. This is Chesley Bonestell. He gave me these prints, by the way. Uh, and this is the old idea from the 1950s in Life magazine and Collier's. And uh, to echo the, the theme, down below is the uh, 
is Central America, where, of course, there's the Panama Canal, and you know who built that. Uh, and this is actually, I, I will make a, a short argument here economically, that if you could get the, the spacefar spacefaring nations to clean up their mess in low Earth orbit, you would have a profitable industry. That is, we've got to do something about this debris pattern, which is pictorially shown here, and here, in, in, uh, the number of dots represents the amount of mass of debris. No, most of it's around the Earth, and the rest of it is out there in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, if you could get them to pay you a fee, you know, like $1,000 a kilogram or something, to bring this stuff down, you could generate a business model. Here, by the way, is how their, the space debris mass is generated, uh, is currently, uh, versus distances uh, above the surface of the Earth. Notice that most of it's in low Earth orbit, and the rest of it is geosynchronous. Uh, I personally think that if, it, uh, if, if you ought to just keep this stuff and collect it in one place at geosynchronous because it's a valuable resource. And with advanced 3D printers, you can make something out of it. You might actually even contemplate doing that for the Earth. This is still up there. Anybody, anybody recognize it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The stuff we put up and the Soviets put up in the 50s is still in low, low Earth orbit. Uh, stuff like this which has gone dead. I won't even go into these mission plans. This is the kind of deorbiting scheme uh, that, that you could look at. This is the essentially the most populated bands of debris. My point is that if you go and scoop it up like this and throw it back into the atmosphere, uh, you should be paid for it. There, that's a business. It, the nation states have shown that they're not interested in doing it. It's actually a, a, an example of the collective problem of the of, uh, of the commons. You will, over exp you will exploit the commons uh, as long as you can until it's regulated. And the sa that's true of everything, including uh, even parking, for example. <laughs> um, uh, this is a complicated diagram saying there's an orbital midden. That's the way I think of it. You know, the, the Native Americans left behind huge shell middens right on the beaches here in Orange County, which once had they think something like a third of a million people living in it a thousand years ago. And, and we know it because they left all the middens. We're leaving a midden in orbit. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you can take the shells and make jewelry out of them, but uh, maybe you could do something with in orbit too, particularly since a lot of it is, is plastics, aluminum, lightweight materials. This is a set of ladies' shoes made in a printer using waste plastic, just in case you're going to need footwear in the space station we're going to build up there eventually. Um, therefore, you're going to need also robotics, and this is the usual figure of a robot. But the space robot robots won't be look like humans. They're going to look like uh, boxes with hands more than anything else. Um, and this is a, a, an example of the uh, kind of orbits that you'll need to produce, and that's why I said nuclear rockets, because they have better ISP features and uh, they can work, or look at it this way, if you had an entire automated facility with robots and, and the capability to ship masses of things like uh, platinum and other elements we know to be rich in the asteroids, you could send it out with a nuclear reactor and you'd barely have to shield it because you're not dealing with the human risk factor. It's just robots. Um, therefore, one of my favorite companies, uh, Planetary Resources, has picked out a specific asteroid which has, I've, I've forgotten how many billions of dollars worth of platinum and other platinum group metals in it. So this thing actually can happen. That is to say, it's, it's a leverage problem. Just like the railroad to California, if you can't bring stuff back from California readily, uh, other than going around the horn, uh, uh, th then the market is very, very diminished. But if you can simply ship it across on a railroad train that takes about a week to get back to the East Coast, then you're in business. So within 20 years of people completing this railroad, people here in Orange County, you know why it's called Orange County? Well, because there aren't any oranges left in it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when I came here in the 1963, uh, I remember driving on the newly opened Garden Grove Freeway and looking at this flat plain. There was a lovely scent in the air, and there were some hills in the distance. Those hills are where you're sitting right now. And it, all that flat plain was the top of the orange trees. <laughs> But the point is, they made a lot of money by shipping oranges to people in the east when they weren't coming from Florida. This is a target asteroid that looks quite mal uh, uh, manageable. It's left over from the uh, construction site that was the solar system. 
I, I would also argue that um, <coughs> sales for freight, oh, I misspelled freight, I just noticed. Uh, <laughs> If you're going to, to send packages with large sales, sales are completely renewable. This is a solar sale, not a beam-driven beam sale, which I've worked on for the Breakthrough Initiative. Then there, there are many opportunities open. But I always try to remind people of this hype cycle. That is to say, <coughs> an idea occurs to bright people like you, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the inflated expectations keep rising. Sobriety returns. <laughs> You fall through the trough of disillusionment. Notice there's no quantitative axis on time here. So it's going to be, sometimes this is just days. Uh, sometimes it's decades, as in our case. Then the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. Our problem is getting out of that trough of despond. And, uh, and it, will, it will take effort, and it's the Mars Society whose job it is to do that, to persuade the, not just the nation, but the world, we can do this stuff. Stepping stones, um, and, and I'm not going to read all this stuff to you. The, the point is to build it gradually. So you further lay the first railroads in the easy valleys, right? Then the later ones go up into the hills where the mining is, and you go on from there. You just build it this way. Americans have done it. One of the advantages we have is that we're Americans and everybody knows that we're the only society that invented an entire literary genre. And I don't mean science fiction, I mean the Western. <laughs> the Western is our formation theory. Science fiction is the next century's Western, is my point. And we can make that analogy happen again. Um, uh, there's a reference here to a Keck Institute ARM proposal 2012 that's worth reading. It's got a lot of interesting detail in it. Oh, whoop. I want to point out this talk, which I think is going to be given at this meeting. I just got uh, Joe Carroll to do it. Uh, to, 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 uh, I forwarded it to, to Bob Zubrin saying, if you've got a slot, put this guy on. Because this is a very nice paper looking at how you will build very cheaply a test facility using a, a, a barbell, essentially. On one hand, the upper stage of the Dragon module I talked to Elon Musk about this a couple of months ago, and he said, that's an ideal look. That's an ideal thing to do, and it's another way I can get money out of NASA, uh, is to use the, the leftover last stage on the Dragon as the counterweight and a habitat over here. And he's got lots of slides. You can see it in detail. And on this single long thing, which uh, is in the scale of a couple of hundred meters at least, um, you can produce lunar gravity, and Mars gravity and have people live in it and do biological experiments and grow crops and you can do so with minimal expense and I, I like this because Joe has worked out all the economics and he's got numbers that will put you to sleep but he, <laughs> his case is a very good one it's exactly what I like to see at a Mars Society meeting I'll be talking about that tomorrow. oh there he is okay I didn't know you're here already you made it from San Diego this early that's unusual um, so, so that's largely my talk, is that it's up to us to think in terms of the resources for the next century. Uh, we're all preoccupied with cost to orbit, which is a very important issue, but we should be also aware of the profits that can gain. And uh, I showed you that diagram before about uh, the hype cycle. But the crucial issue is that you have to get over the, the installation problem of getting the, uh, enough infrastructure to begin to make a feedback process of profitability make some real sense. Of course, you're going to have to do it with the, with the government space agencies, which means mostly NASA. But from everything I hear from various sources about the Chinese program, the Chinese are going to want to be in this business. Or first for prestige. Everybody does the first for prestige. It's just like Columbus. Um, but. They will be, I suspect, if they ever get through their government problem, you notice there is a problem uh, running governments, communist governments, um, <coughs> then they could be a useful ally to us um, because they're the only large-scale technological society, I think, uh, if you omit Japan, um, which really is highly ambitious in this way and sees itself as a new power in the world, as we do. The Europeans are not going to do this kind of thing. Uh, when I talk to people in the European space program, almost none of them 
are, are remotely interested in, in economics. <coughs> they regard government employment as a shelter from economics. <laughs> so I suggest this is the kind of agenda we ought to follow. We ought to be reaching out to other people around the world, whole societies around the world, and saying, this is going to be a great growth sector. You can get in on it, and it, it, not at great sacrifice, but with a plausible reward on a scale of decades. It's, it's shortening this time scale of expectation really matters. In other words, how do you shorten that, that, little, that time in the trough of despond that many people go through in development. I've uh, founded about uh, four companies myself and s helped them grow, co-founded them. Um, and one of my co-founders is right here. Uh, uh, first was a genetics company, uh, which just produced its first drug, the drug for Alzheimer's. But the real problem is getting through that first stage when uh, the problem looks really hard and you have to keep your spirits up. What I like about the Mars Society is that it's good at keeping spirits up, and particularly Bob is. So that's essentially the message, and now I can do a few Q and A's. Uh, maybe a different thing, I'll ask the questions and you give me the answers. Uh, uh, if, would you like that? <laughs> yeah, oh, the wake for the microphone. Where is the microphone? Or, or in, the, in this room you can just shout, you know. <laughs> yes. professional opinion of that book and thesis? Wow. Stan Robinson, Kim Stanley Robinson, is the fourth major SF writer to come out of a 15-year of a period at UCSD who all got doctorates. I was the first, then Werner Vinci, then David Brennan, and then Stan Robinson. Stan is anti-space, largely. I, I mean, he's, he, he likes the solar system. We all like the solar system. We want it to stay there. Uh, but he is opposed to the idea of interstellar colonization by living beings. And he wrote this book, which is frankly, my, my opinion is, it's a stacked deck that, do, does, that falls apart. I wrote a whole essay for the New York Review of Science Fiction about it. Um, there are a lot of technical errors, and the whole thing is made up so, uh, with a con perceived conclusion. Uh, so it's, to me, it's not a serious argument. Uh, if it were a serious argument, it would mean that there would be an explanation for the Fermi paradox. How come nobody's come to visit? Because life forms can never do it. But I don't believe the argument. I think it's just plain factually wrong. Yes, over somewhere. Who? Science is mostly open uh, source. It, wouldn't that speed up the curve for disillusionment? And who is not open source that's slowing it down? Well, op uh, I was a postdoc for Edward Teller, who was an advocate of, of what we now call open so source for exactly the reason you give. And I agreed with him on that. And the, the outstanding example of how, how secrecy is bad and, and, and covetousness in general is bad is that you run out of ideas readily. I mean, it's, it's essentially the major reason I left Livermore after two years on the staff is that I kept working on projects I didn't believe would work. It turned out I was absolutely right. I worked on three projects and they all failed. Not immediately after I left, but very soon, <laughs> within a few years. And I'm not taking any responsibility. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I believe in open source, and that's why I believe in industrial collaboration so much. So you, you work with, say, the Chinese to do these things, not for political reasons, but for profit reasons, because profit lasts. Politics changes. Uh, somebody else? I, I think generally the American spirit of openness is exactly what this needs. The Chinese are not that way, but they're going to be forced to learn to work that way because... Uh, it's, it's going to be a long study, and I think it's going to be the major thing that holds China back is its own culture. So um, another possible analogy, I was interested with your sort of United States development analogy. Another one seems to me to be sort of um, the analogy of um, British maritime dominance and sort of the thesis of Alfred Thayer Mahan about um, sea power that the reason we all are speaking English is because the English controlled the seas. They were able to plant settlements all over the world that developed really well. And, you know, um, 
in space, you might well see the same thing. You know, I mean, whoever controls space is going to, anyway, just a thought. Yeah. Oh, well, sea power is the standard analogy science fiction writers have used it. I mean, uh, I wrote a whole series of the Galactic Center series. The first no uh, novel is called In the Ocean of Night. <laughs> Every title is a sea metaphor. Because that's our cultural experience in the West. Notice it is not the cultural experience of the other major portions of the world. None of them ever actually sailed very much. It was the, the Europeans were the first people that we know of who sailed beyond the sight of land. Even the Portuguese navigators would go around Africa, never lose sight of the land. Of course, they didn't know what was out there either. Yes, sir. I'm going to be giving a talk on uh, a near-Earth asteroid mission involving electric propulsion. In your presentation, Dr. Benson, you pointed out we went through a kind of a Moore's Law development of railroad technology yeah. very rapidly. I think that what's going on with electric propulsion is possibly the same thing. We could have a, an electric propulsion technology that's a thousand times more towing capacity than the Dawn spacecraft. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'd like to see that happen. I haven't seen a Moore's Law work on that. When I was doing experiments at JPL, the, the testing of the electric propulsion was occurring in the same building, and it made an incessant large noise. Uh, the best thing about, about a propulsion in space is that you don't lose anything in acoustic waves, uh, it, which was a serious loss factor. Um, so uh, I, I think they should be developed, and they can be developed for carrying ever larger packages. Uh, but it hasn't been a Moore's Law, uh, but for large thrusts, you're still going to need nuclear, uh, just because the fuel, which is water, basically, is available. Uh, and the, the tricky thing about the electric propulsion is that it has to be very, very high quality, and eventually it does run out of fuel. There's no way to gather more. Okay, one more quick question. Well, I'll try to be quick. You suggested doing an answer and a question. Over 20 years ago, I wrote the closing chapter in the Internet Unleashed textbook in which I pointed out augmented reality plus telepresence, virtual reality, affordable access to space, and Internet access for everyone could lead to essentially a diaspora and expanding things out. So the question that comes out of this is how do we get the six billion almost Internet users who are doing browsing and shopping to start doing telepresence because then they can do useful work here, up there. Uh, in orbit, yeah. Telepresence, is, I haven't even touched on, but that's a very useful resource. If you're hunting down debris and snagging it and tossing it into the atmosphere, you're going to need a lot of hands-on work for navigation. M maybe, I, nobody knows how much, but that's exactly the kind of stay-at-home mom job that you could actually plausibly do in 20 minutes, 20 years maybe. You can make a whole bunch of money sitting at home and catching uh, things of this size and throwing them away for a company that is making a profit at doing that. Last note, this evening we have a panel of uh, SF writers here, 7 p.m., uh, Larry Nevin, Jerry Purnell, uh, Jeff Landis, David Brin, and myself, and I look forward to seeing you there.